Coming up on this episode of The Social Hour, I am joined by guest host Shannon Morse, and we're joined by Gig Ohm's Matthew Ingram. We're going to talk about Facebook privacy, Heartbleed, the new Twitter profiles, and a whole lot more. Coming up. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for the social hour is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is the social hour with Sarah Lane and Shannon Morse. Episode 157, recorded Thursday, April 10th, 2014. This episode of The Social Hour is brought to you by Audible.com. To download a free audiobook of your choice, go to audiblepodcast.com slash social hour. Hey, everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Social Hour. I am Sarah Lane from Twit World Headquarters in Petaluma, California, and normally I would be joined via Skype by the lovely Amber MacArthur, who is usually in Toronto, sometimes she's in Florida, and sometimes she's just somewhere else entirely. But today, Amber's traveling... But I've got good news. I am joined by none other than Shannon Morse, Hi. our resident products guru, products now guru. the host of Before You Buy. Yes, yeah, I just started hosting that about two weeks ago. And it's going very well. I love it. I was super, super excited about starting and, to host that show. Well, and you were already the producer, yeah. so it, it's not as if you're not familiar with gadgets and products yeah, and yeah. you like that stuff. I've gotten a lot of experience in the past year with reviewing products just from the back end, being a producer on it, and doing a weekly review. So this is, it's kind of nothing new for me, but it's a little bit different now hosting it and asking the questions instead of just doing the review. But it's fun. I love it. Good. <laughs> well, I'm glad that you're here to join us on The Social Hour, which you've done in the past. Yes. Um, you are gracious enough, even though you're extremely busy, to say, yes, Sarah, I will not leave you hanging on no, The Social Hour. No, I would never leave you hanging. And you like this stuff anyway. <laughs> I do, yeah. I'm all over the social networks, and I love talking about this kind of stuff. So it's totally Excellent. up my alley. Excellent. Well, you know who else is all over the social networks and happens to be our guest today is Matthew Ingram, who's a senior writer over at GigOM. Hello, Matthew. Hi, thanks for having me. Good. Uh, thanks for being here. Uh, nice to have you. Uh, how, is, uh, how is Canada? Uh, we're deciding to represent Canada in some way without Amber here, just so it feels <laughs> complete. That's right. You, you have to have a Canadian, I understand. <laughs> uh, it's great up here. Snow's all gone. Feels like spring. Good. Finally. Good. Glad to hear that. Yeah, we had a, uh, we had a guest a uh, couple weeks ago who was also based in Toronto, I think actually was on a different show, and he said, it's barbecue season, and Ooh. I know that means a bit, a great deal uh, for yeah, people who sure have been, does. you know, snowbound for, for months and months. <laughs> well, let's get into some of the news that, Matthew, I know that you are, uh, you're keen to talk about. I guess, I guess I kind of have to start off with this heart bleed stuff. Um, mm. you, you know, the, 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 the whole the, the whole issue of, of privacy and security is is something that we couldn't possibly tackle in 15 minutes of talking to you, but it's now gotten to the point where people who are using social networks uh, or casual users don't really know anything about what encryption means are now getting emails being told that they need to change their passwords on sites like Facebook and, and Gmail. And how bad do you think this is? Well, you know, it's hard to say. I mean, the the interesting thing to me is that this has been around, this bug, this flaw has been around for two years. Yeah. So it's, you know, we just have no way of knowing who, it's not like hackers or people who make use of these bugs and flaws, you know, uh, telegraph that. So it could have been, it, it could have been kind of basically back doors open for, for two years or more. So we just, we don't really know. And, and one of the biggest, you know, this is a huge huge thing in, in sort of technological terms. So there's there's literally hundreds of thousands of tiny services or websites or whatever, not just the big ones. They all have to fix their software. They all have to re, you know, recalibrate. They all have to uh, reissue certificates. They all have to get people to change their passwords. That's going to take a long time. So, you know, you may be comfortable with Facebook or Twitter or Google or Yahoo, but it's it's all those other ones that you maybe you forgot about or things that are connected to this or that account. I've got 150 different things connected to Twitter. So how long is it going to take them to do all that? And then when should you change your password? You know, if you change your password now before they fix it, you might as well not do it because then they'll, the, the exploit is still there. Shannon, I know before the show you were mentioning you've got a ton of stuff to change. Although oh my gosh. you're pretty, you're pretty, you take security pretty seriously. You know I what do. you're doing. So, 
It's, I use a password manager right now, and uh, one thing that I noticed recently was that I I had a whole bunch of websites that were still on the same password from like college <laughs> that I just kind of forgot about. So it was exactly what you were talking about, Matthew, where you you completely forget about these sites, and they could be super super vulnerable, and you have no clue until something like Heartbleed happens. So luckily, I was able to go through and change them all. So now I have all these crazy hashed algorithmic passwords that people can't really guess, but still, the fact remains, this hard bleed has been in effect for a long, long time, so it could, which, there could which be Which password stuff. manager do you use? Just I use LastPass at the moment, but okay. uh, KeePass is another one that I've checked out and I really like too. Yeah, I use one password, uh, which is great, and I noticed that LastPass will actually tell you um, which sites um, are still vulnerable, so that you can either wait and change your password, or it's a, it's a cool feature, I'm glad they built that in. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, one of the uh, sites that apparently I'm going to need to change my password for is Facebook. That's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh. it's well, they, uh. it's, Facebook is one of those sites where, and, and maybe it's, it's because I feel that I've been burned by Facebook in the past. I always have people trying to impersonate me on Facebook. Facebook just seems to oh, be yeah. accessible for weirdness. <laughs> so I take the, you know, my password is weirder there than it is anywhere else. You know, it's not any, anything like any other of my passwords. But, uh, but, but yeah, it turns out that, that Facebook is, is possibly part of the issue. Yeah, it, actually there's a great article on Mashable right now that we'll link to in our show notes that tells you for sure where do you need to change your passwords and then also do you need to change your passwords at places that are unclear Facebook being one of them if anything is even remotely unclear and really even if it even if you don't need to change your password it's probably just time to go through and do a nice clean sweep Matthew you wrote an article uh, I guess it was a few days ago now last week about Facebook and the idea that Mark Zuckerberg and his team have kind of had to throw in the towel on you only have one uh, true identity online uh, and realizing that people don't necessarily want to use the web that way. Yeah, I thought it was fascinating in a way because he was sort of, like I said in the post, he was sort of the poster child for, you know, you have to have one identity and it has to be real and it has to be verified. And, and Facebook has really been pounding the table on that for a long time. They, they, they mandated that you use not a real identity, but one that sounded real, so you couldn't use something that was clearly a pseudonym. Um, and, and yet it sounds, at least from some of the interviews he's been giving, as though he's, he's moderated that to some extent, and he now feels that maybe it is okay sometimes if you use a pseudonym. Um, it's not clear whether that will ever become possible on the main Facebook, but it sounds like he's at least thinking about it in terms of the the sub apps, so Instagram, WhatsApp, for example, and maybe some some of the new uh, specialty apps that Facebook is thinking about launching. So I thought that was a pretty big move because they were sort of, if you see pseudonymity as being valuable, they were always sort of the, the bad guy because they were trying to force people to use just one identity. You know, the fact that Facebook is, is in the process of buying WhatsApp and, and, in fact, the FTC is getting involved and ki kind of without saying anything, telling both companies, well, you better not change your privacy policies because you can't do that. <laughs> but I wonder how much of this has to do with Mark Zuckerberg really changing his tune and Mark Zuckerberg saying, gosh, there are all these anonymous or ephemeral or variety of messaging apps, the way that people are socially connecting that are not Facebook, that just go against this idea of being very open mm -hmm. and having all of these photos there forever. I, I wonder how much this is just, you know, I, I, I like to think of him sort of sighing in some conference room and saying, oh, hell with it, fine. <laughs> you know, somebody fine. can use a pseudonym. <laughs> you know, I wonder how much he really feels that this is the right idea versus the world changing around him. Yeah, and it's hard to know, you know, without talking to him. We don't chat that much anymore. He just doesn't return my DMs anymore. But uh, <laughs> um, but he, he, you know, he's a very pragmatic guy and always has been. And so I think it's entirely possible that he has just kind of watched things happen and noticed the rise of these apps and that there are significant chunks of the population who are perfectly happy and, and in fact would prefer to do certain things like photo sharing and, and not have it attached to their quote unquote real identity. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, at some point I think, um, it sounds at least from what I've read that there were debates about this within Facebook. And, and so there were people within Facebook at senior levels who thought it probably 
wasn't a great thing to keep pounding the table on this real identity. Um, so maybe he's just gradually been convinced. And certainly, he, as a pragmatic individual, he's probably watched the rise of those apps and thought, hmm, you know, maybe we should get on the right side of this thing or at least allow it to happen. Well, there's actually an, an article that, that just came out. This I'm looking at the next web, although a lot of people have written about it. I'm sure that Gig Ohm has as well, that Facebook is trying to clean up its news feed, reducing like baiting posts, for example, or content that I may have already seen yesterday on my news feed, links that seem spammy or actually are spammy. What do you... What do you make of this, Matthew? I, I've always felt that Facebook is a little bit of a place for the whole family. You know, kids, mm -hmm. kids can use it, but adults who might be a little less tech savvy or maybe getting into social networking a little bit later also have a good time. When I see something like this, I think, well, that's great for me. That makes Facebook more of an experience that I want. But yeah. how much do you think that face Facebook is really gunning for that kind of breaking news element of Twitter? Well, I think to some extent they feel like they have to do that. And it's certainly been, my impression is at least, that Zuckerberg and the guy who's in charge of newsfeed design, Chris Cox, I think is his name, um, they have always talked, or for a long time have talked about the newsfeed as a newspaper, as a sort of, you know, your personalized newspaper. And so the, the way they see it is that it has to show you things that are useful to you in some way or that are quote-unquote news, however you want to define that. And I think they've been trying to to fine tune it so that you don't see a lot of spammy stuff, so you don't see a lot of ads that aren't relevant, and so you don't see a lot of sort of upworthy or clickbait type of stuff. And the only problem is, what if that's what you actually want to see? What if those things are, you know, maybe not the ads, but what if those things are what you see as valuable? Facebook is effectively trying to do what newspapers used to do, which is to... to select things and say well here's what you need to see and and the only problem is if if users don't see that as as being what they see as valuable then then they're gonna they're gonna react negatively to it and the news feed is actually gonna decrease in value instead of increasing there's been a few times in my personal use with facebook where i've been going through my news feed and i'll be like oh my brother liked this singer who I obviously know that he doesn't actually like. I'm like all of a sudden like I, how can I trust this news feed on Facebook if I don't believe that my friends and family who I know very personally would actually like these things and it drives me kind of nuts sometimes. Um, I feel like over time with Facebook especially with Facebook people are just going to start leaving it if they keep on dealing with these problems with the newsfeed where they're hiding certain things like one of my friends is you know just gave birth and i had no clue because it wasn't on my newsfeed right. things like that that i miss and it just oh it irritates me so much yeah there is and I think, go ahead matthew yeah i was just going to say that's the problem with facebook deciding what to show you um i mean one of the things that people like about twitter i think is that you know you follow people and or things and you see what they tweet and so to, to a large extent, Twitter is not screwing around, at least not yet, with <laughs> showing you specific things and fiddling around with it. And the more Facebook does that, you know, the, for every person that increases the, the utility of it for them, there's going to be other people that decreases the utility and they just stop using it. Well, all right, we're mentioning Twitter, and I've got to ask, Matthew, how in the world do you have one of the cool new Twitter profiles, at least in the web version of Twitter, which we're looking at right now, which is, you know, everybody says, well, this looks just like Facebook, or it looks more like Facebook than it ever has before. I don't have this new Twitter profile, so obviously it's rolling out to, to users in waves, but it looks pretty nice. Do you like it? You know, I do in, in some ways, and I don't in others. I mean, it's quite... When you when you think of the old one, this one is a lot larger. Everything's larger. The, your avatar photos are larger. All the tweets are larger, and so it it kind of it's not like shouting, but it's a lot sort of more in your face than than the old one. Um, I, I I think it's fine. I to be honest, I don't go to people's profiles that much, so and I don't use the web version of Twitter a, at all. So it doesn't really. I mean, I guess it's. You know, it's fine if people, if it, if it's easier for people who do go there and check people's profiles. But I just, I don't do that a lot. So I think it's not, it's not really me they're doing this for. It's for maybe users who aren't that familiar with Twitter to kind of 
drag them in or, or convince them that it's that it's valuable in some way. Or sure, or have a Facebook profile and think, you know, maybe yeah. I'm mm -hmm. ready to get get onto Twitter and it doesn't really look that different than than the format that they're pretty used to. I do, I, I, you know, the cover photo is huge. You've got a nice little, you know, you live on a lake. I know this because I follow you on Instagram. <laughs> so you've got all these beautiful sunset photos. And yeah, the profile picture is nice. Here's your information. You've got uh, tweets, quite a few tweets there, Matthew, although I know you do a lot of mm. uh, replying to people. So, you know, that has to be factored in. Plus a nice how many photos and videos uh, are part of uh, ever, all of your correspondence. Following followers, favorites. That's interesting. Favorites is very front and center. Um, and I don't, Matthew, what do you use as your Twitter client? I use Tweetbot. I use TweetDeck, and Tweet and Deck. on the, on on mobile devices, I use the official client. Okay, so what do you uh, what do you make of Twitter now allowing not just multiple photo uploads through the official clients, but the tagging of people in photos? I don't feel like I've seen that many people using that feature. No, I haven't either, to be honest. And I wonder if you know maybe people just don't know that it's available yet, or they don't. I've seen marketers use the uploading multiple photos so they can show you four all at once. Mm -hmm. And and I have to say, in TweetDeck, uh, in the columns, it basically stacks all those up. So you basically have four photos in a row with nothing, with no information. And it really blows up a TweetDeck column when someone shares four photos all at once. Um, so it doesn't work particularly well on that platform, but uh, I'm assuming it's not aimed at sort of power users or whatever who, who are using TweetDeck. Um, the tagging, to be honest, I, the only time I've been tagged is uh, someone at Twitter uploaded something and tagged me. And it was kind of a surprise. I forgot that you were even allowed to do that. I don't think I've ever been tagged by anyone, and that's probably a good thing. <laughs> I, I I have not, yeah, not that I know of, in the last you week can do or that? so. What? Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, it's I a new thing. I kind of like I like the new profile. I feel like it kind of reminds me of old school blogs in a way, where you have a nice big header and you have all the links mm. up at the top, and it's very easy to get from page to page. And I also noticed whenever you click on any of the tweets in his timeline it takes you directly over to the tweet. You don't have to, yeah. you know, click on a down arrow and then choose, you know, see see this post or whatever the link was. It's interesting it that you say easier. you like it because it has an old school blog look. Yeah, because I think for a lot of people, it it's feels like welcoming. those days are behind yeah. us. You know, we're all about <laughs> mobile and apps and I think different. it's pretty. And I do go to people's profiles a lot because, you know, I'm, I'm in the social networking era and I'm trying to find people to follow and people to connect with and network mm -hmm. with because that's part of my job. So, you know, for me, looking at profiles is something that I do occasionally, not too often, but you know. No, I think then. the only time I look at anyone's profile is if they at reply me something weird and I think, who's this <laughs> Yahoo, you know? And then I go read the bio and I say, oh, forget it. A lot of times yeah. I'll find myself going if like it says, oh, your friends uh, Sarah, Matthew Ingram, and uh, P. Delahanty started following, uh, you know, chat, OMG Chat or something like that. Right. And I'm like, oh, right. who's this guy? OMG Chat. Yeah. Oh, right. okay. He and that's cool. And that right. discovery definitely works. Uh, it, it, when it works, it works. Yeah. Right. And I do think that's what they're, that's what they're aiming at. Like the profile is a, I think they want to make it easy so that if you're looking for new people to add, if you're a new user or you're trying to grow your network, that it's easy for you to go there and get a whole bunch of pleasantly displayed information about that person and figure out are they valuable you know should you follow them mm -hmm. well Matthew I know that you are I mean you are you are quite prolific on Twitter uh, in fact you're one of the best sources of news not just your own news but 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 serving up retweeted news uh, for me and uh, for that I thank you but last question for me uh, as far as Twitter goes sure we've got some design changes. Uh, obviously, Twitter is interested in growing its user base. Maybe it'll never get to Facebook's user base, but that's certainly the idea, um, being a network that is welcoming for everyone and not just uh, a bunch of syntax for geeks that, that the real world doesn't understand. Do you think that Twitter is making the right decision uh, with this move? Do they have a choice now that they're public uh, to, to, to keep it uh, something that non-technical people enjoy and like as well? I actually don't think they really have a choice. I mean, I think at some point Twitter could have become something different and, you know, we could debate for hours whether that would have been a good thing or not. But I think when they raise so much money and then, then that means you eventually have to go public or be acquired, you go public, you have all these pressures um, to generate revenue, 
and to generate growth. And so I think they, you know, it's not enough for, for Twitter to say, well, hey, we're, we're a cool tool that sort of 3% of people use and it's really awesome and, you know, media people like us and it's great when you tweet the Oscars. Like, they, they, it's just not enough. They have to show that they're growing and that they're expanding and that they're reaching new markets and that's going to require certain things. And we've seen some of those things uh, occur already and we're going to see some, some more. Whether people like them or not remains to be seen. Well, Matthew Ingram, senior writer over at Gig Ohm, thank you so much for joining us on The Social Hour. You have been on the show with Amber and I in the past, but it's been a few years, so thank you for being brave enough to join us again. <laughs> Great. Well, thanks for having me. And let people know where they can uh, follow you online and find more of the stuff that you're writing about and retweeting about all day, every day. Well, at Matthew I with one T is the best way. All right. Well, have a great weekend, and thanks again for joining us. Okay, thanks. Well... I wow. enjoyed that very much. Me too. It's it was nice to meet him, finally. <laughs> you know, it was, fun, it was funny. Before the show, of course, our chat room is actively chatting, and someone said, so do you guys have a guest every week? And it's, you know, we've never really made some sort of a declaration one way or another, but yeah, I think Amber and I, um, and you, please do weigh in. I think it it's fun to have a good conversation off the top of the show. I agree. It's, I just have a lot of enjoyment out of meeting new people. That too. Me, I just love yeah. talking to all these different interesting people because everyone has something to say and yeah. it's really cool to get them on camera and just talk. I also find that, you know, in, in many cases, uh, and this is probably a little bit self-serving for the social hour, but these are people that I feel like I know pretty well, but I yeah. don't. Matthew and I have never met. Yeah, I know but how I, he feels. But he's part of my life every day. Yeah particularly in the mornings, because he's in <laughs> Canada, so he gets up earlier. So I wake up and it's like, Twitter, 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 Twitter. Matthew's been very busy. Uh, but uh, no, he's he's great. If you don't uh, follow uh, Matthew on Twitter, yeah, that's Matthew I, Matthew with one T. You really should, because he is all over the news and has a lot of opinions too, and he's not afraid to share them. Quick reminder, if you're not watching us live, we do record the show at noon Pacific time on Thursdays, 3 p.m. Uh, Eastern time. Uh, of course, we are on demand. You can watch us any way you like. Just go to twit.tv slash TSH. That is where all of our shows live in perpetuity. All of our episodes are there. Quickly grab the video, subscribe to the show if you'd rather have the video delivered to you each week. Try to make it as easy as possible for you to follow along. And of course, all the links to uh, guest uh, websites that we mention, news articles that we're, we're talking about, apps that we cover, those are all there as well. All right, before we get into some of the news of the week, we want to thank Audible for sponsoring this episode of The Social Hour. Audible is, well, it, it, it's, it's, really, it's really the only place that we can possibly recommend for audiobooks because there are over 150,000 downloadable titles on Audible. And these aren't just fiction, it's all types of literature. There is fiction, but there's nonfiction. There's autobiographical stuff. There's even periodicals. Sci-fi and fantasy. Sci-fi and fantasy. <laughs> Is there anything that you've you've listened to on Audible, Shannon, that you want to suggest? Let's see. I'm really big into the vampire books. You are. This yes. I know. This like, I know uh, about you. Oh, what are they called? The Vampire Academy ones. Okay. I think that's Which what is, it's called. I guess that would be considered Rochelle Mead. young lit. It is, yeah it's, yeah. it's it's young literature, and there's a little bit of a love story and lots of fighting and love, stuff. Love, love that. Fun. Yeah, that's it. And and <laughs> it's a it's a series, right? Yes, it's a whole series. I, th I believe there's like more than five books now. It's like Sweet Belly High, but with vampires. And they're making a movie about it, too. Are they? Yeah. Not surprised. So yeah, if you want to get into Vampire Academy, but you're like me, and you think... Uh, I'd really like to have a few more hours of my day to just sit around and read. I never feel like I have that. Or, you know, when, I, when I'm at home at night and I'm ready to, uh, you know, get, get out my iPad or something and read, <laughs> I just can't keep my eyes open. Audible's great, though, for listening to content while you're doing stuff throughout the day. Maybe you commute a lot, you know, you're sitting on a train or you're like me, you're in your car or you're exercising, or you can play it at home, maybe even with your headphones or, or even, uh, you know, a, 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 
uh, attach it to your speakers. That's actually something that I do sometimes when I'm cooking and uh, I know I'm going to kind of be stuck in the kitchen for a while. Listen to a book on Audible. And actually, if you haven't tried Audible before, for listeners and viewers of The Social Hour, Audible is offering a free audiobook to give you a chance to just try out the service. And I think that that's really important. Take advantage of this because it can be a little weird, the idea of Oh, am I listening to a book? Is that really the same as reading? And I think once you do, you'll agree, that, yeah, it, it really is. And it kind of lets your imagination go nuts in a fun way that reading doesn't. One audiobook could be, uh, you could try the episode one of Vampire Academy, or anything you like. To download a free audiobook of your choice, we'll suggest audiobooks, but it's all up to you. Just go to audiblepodcast.com slash social hour and choose one. And at the end of your trial, you get to keep it. It is a free book. It's like taking a free book from the library and then you never actually have a library and get mad at you. <laughs> Audiblepodcast.com slash social hour. And thanks so much to Audible for sponsoring our episode. In fact, it's episode 157 for anybody wow. who's keeping score. So we were talking about Twitter with Matthew Ingram uh, just a couple minutes ago. And a great story from the Washington Post that Amber actually found and sent it over to me that Twitter is good at predicting unemployment. And what's interesting about this is there was a research team over at uh, the, uh, I guess it was the, well, let me, let me, let me tell you exactly University what they... University of Michigan and Stanford. Okay, all right, cool. Those guys. All right, so <laughs> these guys have put together, hey, let's try to figure out if you can find out about trends, real trends that, that matter, you know, to, 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 to uh, national wealth uh, as unemployment. And what they did was they decided to uh, not only have keywords that they were following, such as uh, lost my job, uh, hashtag unemployed, that sort of thing, but they really started to get uh, granular um, with, uh, with, with, with slang, axed canned, <laughs> um, pink slip. Well, pink slip is not really a, a slang, but, oh, but, so but yeah, they, they tried to make it so, okay, well, let's, let's think about keywords, but also kind of sentiment, sentiment of, um, you know, if you were, if you lost your job and maybe you went and got some happy hour drinks mm -hmm. with somebody who was picking up the tab, maybe you're a little upset and maybe you're misspelling some things. So there was, there was all <laughs> sorts of of stuff that went into the research. And it turns out wow. that if you compare it against actual official employment reports, which are published uh, certainly in the US, uh, gosh, uh, I, is it monthly or quarterly? I feel like I'm listening to them all the time, that they do start, to, you start to see uh, rises in uh, tweets that reference being unemployed as the unemployment rate goes up and vice versa. Yeah. Which is, just goes to show you, it's not as if Twitter is predicting anything really, but it's a really good indicator uh, that people do want to talk about what's going on. Oh, for sure. I completely understand this. I believe that there, a few years ago maybe it was, uh, there was a website that searched through public Twitter posts and found th everything that they could find about drugs, like marijuana. Uh -huh. So you could see like all these people tweeting about how much dr drug use that they've been doing. So it's not surprising to me that somebody is able to put together a post like this and right. say, hey, here is the research I've been doing. Here is you know how many people have been lost, losing their jobs and been posting about it on Twitter. Because people are very, very outspoken on Twitter. You know, they talk about all sorts of personal things. Right. So I, it's I, th there was surprising. There was something that we covered uh, a little while back that was also a can Twitter predict the flu? The flu. Oh. And you know <laughs> the pre the word predict is can be a little misleading because it's more of just it's mirroring what's going yeah. on. Not but necessarily it was, it was, it was, prediction of the future. Right. But, but it's sort of like hey you know uh, people in the greater Washington D.C. area uh, there are, seem to be a lot of tweets about the flu. Oh. Maybe you know maybe the the next metropolitan area better watch out because you know flus spread seasonally. And we sort of went ah that's really interesting because again. People just talk about this stuff. Yeah. Um, and when it comes to something like job loss or job gain, that's the sort of thing that, that's a big deal. Yeah, I mean, it's a I, huge deal. It's, a, it's one of those life-changing things that people do want to share, they want to talk right. about. Yeah. You know, whether it's to gain sympathy or whether it's just to, you know, praise their excitement and be like, yeah, I did this. So it's, it's not surprising to me that they were able to figure this stuff out. It's really cool. 
I think it's, it is very cool. So Twitter, uh, not that bad at predicting unemployment. So hopefully <laughs> uh, the number of unemployed tweets is going down, which means that more of us are all staying employed, and that's a good thing. That's good. All right, so let's talk about Facebook again for a second. Uh, this is an interesting story that uh, came out yesterday. Facebook is soon going to force any user that enjoys the Facebook chat functionality to use Facebook Messenger, which is a standalone app that has been around for a while, but has always been a, a, a separate app from the main Facebook app that you could use if you just wanted to chat with people without having the entire Facebook experience, but could be seen as a little bit odd because if you want to check your news feed, uh, maybe look at your events list, and then respond to a couple of Facebook chats. You can do that all on the Facebook app. Of course, you can do that at Facebook.com as well. Facebook Messenger is its own thing. And it's sort of like, well, OK, you can use it as a communication tool, but then you have to go to, back to Facebook for everything else. What do you make of this, Shannon? Do you, do you care? I, I happen to, on iOS, I happen to really like the Facebook Messenger app. I think it's very well done, but you know, I. I'm sort of a sucker for a good design. So this doesn't bother me, but I think it's gonna make a lot of people mad. It's annoying. Yeah. <laughs> I don't like this. I don't like it at all. I like having all of my Facebook stuff in one app with one notifier that shows up on my little notifications tab, and that's it. I don't want them cluttering up my home screen with more separate apps, because right now we have the Facebook app. Yeah. And then we're gonna have this Messenger app. What's next, a newsfeed app? Like. It's possible. I just want everything in one place. That's it. Just leave me alone, Facebook. If you give me too many apps, I'm going to be busy sitting around on Facebook all day. <laughs> well, I think, you know, and, and you know, I, I, I guess before Facebook decided that they wanted to buy WhatsApp, I would have said, well, this is them doubling down on we've got the messenger service yeah. that we want everyone to use. And here's we're going to make it a standalone app. So even if you hate everything else about Facebook, you might end up using this app and then we still win. But you still have to have an account. But you still have to have an account. That's true. That's that's absolutely true. But now that they bought WhatsApp, which has, well, I think it's 450 million mm -hmm. users or something yeah. pretty crazy, exponential growth. Some uh, predict that WhatsApp will be bigger than Facebook at some point um, as people just want to chat with their friends and not necessarily have the whole social network experience. So Does, this is the new AOL Instant Messenger. Kind of, <laughs> but what you know? What happens to WhatsApp? Facebook Messenger is yeah. uh, Facebook is saying you need Facebook Messenger if you want to use our service. If they buy WhatsApp. Does WhatsApp stay another competing service? It doesn't make a lot I of sense. I assume they would merge it. I would. I would assume it would all become Facebook Messenger yeah. sooner than later, but. And, and I guess, again, I sort of like Facebook Messenger, but I think I'm in the minority. I know a lot of people who's, who say, it I've does. never used it. I would never use it. I use it a lot because, um, you know, with wedding planning, it's really, really easy to just email people real quick and say, hey, has your address changed before I send out RSVPs or whatever? So that's really nice about it. Um, it's very easy to just ping somebody real quick, especially if I don't have their phone number. It's great. But um, I think I, I understand why Facebook is doing it, because they, you know, they feel like it's just kind of bogged down and it's kind of hidden in the Facebook app. So they want to, you know, make it speed it, speed it, speed it up a little bit, and mm -hmm. make it easier for people to use. So I don't know. Maybe they're trying to get more people to use it by separating it out. Yeah, I think that's probably the strategy. Uh, but uh, but uh, for anybody who, and if you're somebody who's saying, well, that's just that's crazy, but I refuse. You actually could just visit facebook.com on your mobile device. You can use Facebook that way and Messenger would be built in. Facebook, of course, on the web, this isn't going to change. It's not as if they won't let you use the chat functionality on the web. This is just really mobile-based. But it is interesting that Facebook makes you know, a, a, the bulk of its advertising revenue via mobile. It took them a while, but that's it's been very successful for the company. And they still feel, OK, well, this needs to be broken out into its own thing. Will they monetize Facebook Messenger as a standalone app? They certainly don't now. I don't know the answer. I'd, I've never really understood how that would work if Maybe it's just conversations sends between you people. <laughs> Maybe a company sends you Try messages. Try our new Coca Cola brand. Which is already happening Ooh. to me on Snapchat, by the way. Oh. There have been a couple times where someone, because it's, it's a funny username, yeah. wants to be my friend, and I think, oh, maybe that's somebody I know, and I just 
didn't realize because they've got a funny username. Mm -hmm. And then I look at a five second ad and I'm so angry. Oh, I hate that. <laughs> oh, I'm not gonna do that anymore. If I don't know you, if you didn't if you didn't Facebook message me that you want to add me on Snapchat and I know you, I will never click on your stupid five second it's ephemeral there. message again. <laughs> Speaking of new apps, uh, this was a big story from Dropbox yesterday. They had a uh, press conference in San Francisco, announced a bunch of new stuff. Uh, one of those is an app called Carousel, which is, it sounds like right now, what it, what it does is attempts to manage uh, the photos that are on your, your, your device. That's, you know, for, for me, it's my iPhone. Um, and your photos on Dropbox and wants to to sort of be an, an intelligent place uh, to store everything. I think that, I just actually went through this at the Apple store yesterday, Shannon, because I smashed my iPhone screen and I needed a new iPhone and I was having iCloud backup problems and they, uh. they were saying, well, the, you know, how many videos do you have on your phone? Maybe you need to delete some of those. How, how much of that stuff do you really need? And it's like, all of it. Yeah. I don't, yeah, that's, that's a stupid question. <laughs> that's why I have, these are my memories. Yeah. So they need to be, there has to be some better way to make sure that I can keep them all. So it sounds like that's what Dropbox wants to do. Hmm. Do you use Dropbox? Do you like the idea of Dropbox being a place to manage photos even on other networks, which it sounds like they're also keen on doing? It sounds interesting, but currently I don't think that I have a use for it. I, I do use Dropbox currently, and I just use it to share files with my coworkers and things like that because it's easy. Uh, when it comes to photos, though, I usually just use the Google Plus automatic upload off of my Nexus 5. It's pretty much the same thing. It automatically backs them up as soon as I take a photo, and sometimes it makes them really cool with an auto awesome video or whatever. Mm -hmm. But that's that's all I need. So I don't I don't know if I'll use this. I'll check it out for sure, but I don't think it's gonna change my life or anything like that. Yeah, I I don't know. I I I, I like Dropbox, the company. I think that uh, in general, it's a it's a it's a wonderful tool. Dropbox has made great strides. Uh, to be just not a storage place. You know, Dropbox, when, when I first decided to start backing things up to Dropbox, it was, it was not a visual. It was janky, and it, it was years ago. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was certainly not visual. You got some folders, it worked. Yeah, it was so bad. But it wasn't. Not even it, secure. <laughs> right, it just, it just wasn't necessarily like fun to use. And the company, obviously, they bought Mailbox, which is a very popular uh, email app. Um, they, they've, uh, they've, they've, They've announced uh, an enterprise version of Dropbox, so there's Dropbox Business, which would, if you use Dropbox for work and feel like, oh, I've got this personal and then I've got a business, uh, it would be, uh, it'll be a place to, to merge the two uh, within one Dropbox account, which is obviously very convenient for folks. But the whole photos situation, I think I'll be interested to see if Dropbox can figure this out because I, you know, and I, I haven't really started using Carousel because I've heard some weird things about how Dropbox will, uh, it's not actually syncing to your local uh, uh, photos, it's it's basically copying them and so it creates storage problems yeah. and it's like, that that's actually my problem already. So I don't need my Dropbox folder, which is always full anyway, to then be <laughs> really full of photos that I don't necessarily need on Dropbox. So I kind of have to, to test the waters, but I think that that the idea that um, you might post a photo to Path or mm -hmm. Facebook, or it's locally on your phone, or some of it is you know backed up uh, um, with uh, with your Google services. Mm -hmm. There still seems to be like a peppering of photos all over the internet, yeah. at least for me. Yeah. So if we figure out, okay, well if it's Dropbox or somewhere else, Dropbox's carousel, that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. I just don't know that that exists yet. I don't think it does. Well, hmm. it should. <laughs> All right, so should we talk about something pretty cool, which is the first Instagram post from the International Space Station? Yeah, so this is totally awesome. I've been really getting into everything about the International Space Station recently. Have you? And yes. what, 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 what? What what turned you on to the International Space Station all of a sudden? <laughs> uh, we did a we did an interview with a guy named Liam Kennedy on Coding 101, and oh, cool. it was about this little Raspberry Pi that will blink a bunch of LEDs whenever the ISS goes above you. So it's really cool if you're like in the middle of the night, you can run outside, and sometimes you get lucky and you can see the ISS going over you. It's so awesome. So it really got me interested in 
you know, learning more about the International Space Station, why they're up there, what kind mm -hmm. of research they're doing. And so I, I find this very, very funny. And I'm like, it's about time they took a selfie and posted it on Instagram. American astronaut Stephen R. <laughs> Swanson uh, posted this uh, from the uh, Kapoa observational module um, in the International Space Station. Of course, of course, he's up there. And it's, uh, it's kind of fun. I mean, there, this is actually, a, 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 this is actually, if you think about this photo, it's, Totally crazy. Now, this was not on Instagram; it was on Twitter. Wow. Um, before I think, it, I think it was before in Instagram. No, it wasn't before Instagram existed because that was uh, July of 2013. But it's a photo of a droplet of water in front of this astronaut, Karen Nyberg. And at first, That's when you so look at cool. it, you think, "What? What sort of weird photo filter software was this?" But no, it's actually. That, the, I don't. I don't know how it's long. It's just chilling there. I don't know how long it took her to get that photo, but it is pretty amazing. But I think it's you know it's not so much about a selfie on Instagram. It's the fact that we now yeah. are in in communication, getting communication wow. from people in space. It's amazing. You know, and before they're it was in outer of, space. They're, they're in, miles above us. Many, many miles. It's incredible. Yeah, <laughs> it really. I, it, it, the more the merrier. I mean, I am into it. I am into it. I'm more selfies from space, please. I agree, especially because um, I I'm living vicariously through these guys. Well, see, <laughs> so my I and that's as far as I choose to go. I, I know it's an unpopular way to feel, but I don't want to ever go into space. Yeah, I'm, space scares me, but I like to see what's yeah. I, I I'm very moved by yeah. the sort of experience and the visuals and and the good work that people actually do in space. So thank goodness we oh, have these it. selfie tools so that I see more <laughs> more about that. I don't know what my problem is, Shannon. I just It's okay. I just don't, don't want to go into space. I don't want to go deep diving. <laughs> I opposite. don't really want to do that either. <laughs> I guess it has to do with breathing. I've got <laughs> issues with if it's hard to breathe, uh, yeah. Gravity, <laughs> mm. I just don't like deep sea monsters. I'm okay going up there. Yeah. I can deal with outer space monsters and Cylons. I'm totally cool with that. But sure. Sting me underwater? Nope. Yeah. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's dark. It is dark. And cold. Yeah. Well, it's I guess it's cold. dark and cold in space, too. <laughs> well, we've got a, we've got a lot to figure out yet before this planet self-destructs. But, uh, okay, so let's move on to our gig of the week. Uh, this, is, this is kind of fun uh, thing that, again, Amber decided, you know, we're talking about social all week. Uh, we, you know, spend an hour talking about social and a lot of people like the show and ask us repeatedly, well, how do I get involved in, you know, some sort of a job that would pay me to be a social? Uh, this is, uh, if you look on LinkedIn, there are a variety of digital marketing manager jobs and that might not be the first thing that you search for if you're looking for something in social. Oh. You might be thinking, oh, social, the, uh, uh, communications expert or, or whatever. Dig digital yeah. marketing um, can be, and Amber's actually much well-versed, more well-versed in the marketing world than I am, but quite a few jobs that end up, you know, this is marketing, but they end up having a lot of social components. These are jobs all over the world. I mean, we've got Hong Kong, Toronto. There's Ubisoft in here? Ooh. Yeah, exactly, Accenture, uh, Catalyst. These are these are big companies. Uh, Burton Snowboards. I would love to be a digital marketing manager for a snowboard company. Oh, that would That'd be, be so awesome. fun. I could talk like a, you know, snowboarder, whatever that means. <laughs> but uh, yeah, definitely take a look. We'll put this in our in our show notes, of course. Of course, if you're on LinkedIn, you can just search for digital marketing manager, and uh, and just take a look at all of the different uh, opportunities that may be out there and maybe uh, appeal to you. They are, uh, they all, you know, it's not all the same job, but it's certainly a category that there are a lot of opportunities in. So, good luck. All right, so we've got a video of the week. This is kind of interesting. Uh, there's there's an anti-bullying video um, that came out of uh, Singapore. And the idea about this is that it's a, you know, it's, a, it's sort of like a, well, it's actually really sad, but it's a it's a cartoon that uh, is illustrating the fact that you know bullying is not only wrong but you know is is very detrimental. Um, it 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 hurts and and people are affected by it and in in some cases end up you know terrible results, not just unhappiness, but you've got you know kids committing suicide. This is a big problem, and the idea behind the video is that the more you share the video. The short, uh, via social, 
um, when you when you first launch the video, there's a you know big button to share it on Facebook. Uh, the shorter the video gets, as in, it's as if you are eradicating bullying online. So it's a little bit of you know a little bit of a gimmick, but it's it, it, it's 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 almost as if the more it gets shared, you're helping to end this trend that I know is certainly for young people is a serious business, but it happens at all ages. Aww. I know. I know. It makes me sad. It makes me sad too, and I really, I guess it's not, I, I, I understand bullying, and I know that, you know, particularly. I know, a bunch of jerks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand it as in I am making excuses for it, but I understand that it happens particularly, you know, with the younger set, but adults bully oh, yeah. each other too. And, you know, online it can get really ugly. And I am so glad that when I was in high school, there weren't the tools that there are now for You're people so to lucky. make, you know, like a I hate Sarah Lane fan page or something. Because I, I just can't imagine how hurtful that would mm -hmm. have been. And that's something that kids have to deal with so much more now. I mean, there's just yeah. so much coming at them and so many ways to be anonymous and people don't always behave. Oh, that's so true. I, I have two younger siblings mm. and one of them has dealt with a lot of bullying online because she she has a lot of dramatic friends and there's a whole nother tangent there. But basic matter of this is she's called me several times crying because she didn't know how to deal with it. And I've had to talk to her and I've had to just you know, be like, look, be strong. Like, their opinion doesn't matter. What opinion? What opinions matter are your own, you know, and things like that. So, yeah, bullying is a serious issue, and there's there's a lot of kids out there who have gone into a major depression or even committed suicide because of it. And I feel really, really strongly about it. So, I think anything that is going to help help stop bullying or help, you know more people understand that it's not a good thing to bully people online, no matter what your age is, mm -hmm. then yeah, I say go for it. Yeah, yeah, I totally, 100% uh, agree with you. I wonder how effective this sort of thing is. I think it's easy for us to say, oh, that's great, what a nice thing. You know, you put together a video and it's, it's about uh, awareness and I don't know how much the people who are doing the bullying yeah, get out of this. They'll probably just look at it and laugh. Something like that, yeah, because kids can be so brutal, and so can adults, actually. But uh, <laughs> yes. but I, I think that this is, I think that that, you know, certainly getting through to the people who are behaving inappropriately, even though it's difficult, should never be stopped. Mm -hmm. It's all about, it is about awareness, and the more people who understand that, oh, this is actually happening, this is a thing that's happening and is extremely hurtful uh, in many cases, uh, the better. So good on it, you, Singapore. Even if it just, like, you know, makes a little bit of sentiment happen in some bully's head that where they go, oh, well, maybe maybe this is wrong, but I'm still going to bully for a little while, and then eventually they stop. I mean, even right. that would be nice. Exactly. I mean, it's cruelty. Mm -hmm. It's cruelty, it and the, you know, the, the more awareness that you have that that is unacceptable, the better. Absolutely. Uh, by the way, if you want to share this video or just watch it, uh, shareittoendit.com is the URL, and we'll have that in our show notes as well. All right. Uh, reminder, uh, we love hearing from you. We're kind of getting to the end of our hour here, so we're going we're gonna to breeze through the show, not w without our rat or fad. But um, for next week, email us at thesocialhour at twit.tv. You can call us and leave us a voicemail at 2626-SOCIAL. You can record a video. Send us, send us something that you read online that you'd like us to cover. Tweet at us. Of course, I'm at Sarah Lane. Shannon Morse is Snubs. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, Amber Mac is Amber Mac on Twitter as well. Twitter ha happens to be, kind of seems to be the best place um, for the, all of you to get a hold of us. But we're on all the social networks, so please feel free. All right, without further ado, ra rounding up uh, our show is our Ratter Fad segment. And I think this actually uh, it works really well with our, with our last discussion. This is Teens and teens behaving well, and who better to teach them than maybe their schools? Now, I'm, I'm, mm. I'm a little tongue-in-cheek here because I'm not exactly sure that teachers and parents are always that adept at social media, but there is uh, something happening. Um, there's actually a, a privacy curriculum developed at a law school, Fordham Law School in New York, where uh, kids, are, are learning the value of online privacy 
um, at a young age. So this is not sort of like, ooh, um, uh, little little uh, little Jamie ended up uh, talking to somebody online that may not be who they say they are, and. Uh, mom and dad have to sit down and have a talk with Jamie. This is actually, this is part of the training that you get as a student, how to be in life, you know? Multiplication, privacy mm -hmm. training, because this stuff isn't going away, and maybe parents are clueless enough that they're not talking to their kids about this, so it should actually be part of a curriculum. Oh yeah, there's there's a whole generation gap there between parents yeah. and little kids, or, well, teenagers now, I guess, teenagers and even younger uh, 20-somethings that are, you know, they don't fully understand privacy, so they feel like they can share everything and anything that they want. And when I try to explain this to my younger siblings, again, it, sometimes it gets um, back with laughter. Sometimes they're just like, oh, whatever, Shannon, you don't know anything. And I'm just like, trust me, I do. Trust me on this. <laughs> so I try to explain it to them, but I think it's kind of nice that they're kind of giving them handbooks on this type of thing. I don't know how much usefulness they're going to get out or out of it or if they'll even pay attention and you know read the handbook or listening to the teachers and instructors talking about this kind of thing but i hope they do uh this same article over at boston.com mentions the saint michael school in uh a, sur a suburb of saint louis uh that middle school uh students were learning uh, how to manage their digital reputations i guess a law student instructor um, from washington university w that was nearby came in and talked about facial recognition software, not only used by Facebook, but also at a local mall. So mm -hmm. this is something that you need to realize is happening. It's not That's just cool. social networking, but it's something that can be that can be used, not necessarily against you, but used in some form online based on where have you actually been, mm -hmm. who you've been talking to, what, you know, what does it mean when you send a text that you instantly regret? Well, Somebody's got it. Yep. You know, if you delete it, it doesn't really matter. The message has already been sent and now can proliferate all over the place. So I don't know. I think it's, I th not having been in any of these training sessions uh, and knowing that sometimes uh, there are varying degrees of, of, of wits that people have about them as far as privacy goes, I would say I think this is rad. I think it's probably, you know, the online privacy is not some sort of a fad that's going to go away. It's something that we have to pay more and more attention to. And, you know, certainly with something like Heartbleed, it's like, yeah. I mean, privacy and security are not always, you know, the same conversation, but not having... A lot of times they are. Yeah, not having <laughs> enough security certainly affects your privacy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, so, yeah, I think it's, 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 again, more awareness is probably better for the kids. Keep going at it, kids. Yeah. <laughs> well, Shannon, this has been a wonderful hour. Thank you so much for Thank joining you. us. Yeah, I had a great time. I'm so glad. I did, too. Please, but um, next time Amber is unavailable, I'm going to ask you again. Sure. And I, and I Anytime. hope that you're available again. <laughs> Yay! Thanks to all of you for joining us as well. Reminder, we are live on Thursdays, uh, noon Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern. I'm going to get that eventually. I'm going to get that. I'm still <laughs> new com time. committing it to memory. <laughs> new time, new time. Uh, but of course, if you can't watch us live, we do hope that you watch or listen at your leisure. In fact, I'd love to know. Would you like it, you know, listening to to us on the commute or or on your big TV at home? It would just kind of be fun to take a little poll and see how everybody everybody absorbs the show. But until next week, we will keep at the social networks and be back with another show next Thursday, as always. Until then, have a great week. Bye.